So guys, good evening. <clears throat> it's my um, pleasure to welcome Stelios, Astelios Agatidis, um, to give this evening's lecture. And uh, the lecture falls into a series that is uh, organized with the Stelios Ulle Stiftung für Baukunst that was founded by Günther Bock in 2002, I think, if I remember correctly. And so a few years ago, um, Within our lecture series, they began then a, so to speak, a, a sub-series. And, um, and I'm representing them tonight, and it basically it revolves around, the, or is about inviting students um, architecture class alumni back to speak. We've had a series of um, very exciting lectures. And it's, of course, also um, exciting to turn around and then to discover that within these years, quite a few that, has, that have left the, the program, um, turn in emerging, or so to, if not even soon, established careers. And Shilos is one of them. When <coughs> I first arrived teaching here, commuting from Oslo in 2001, Stelios was uh, in his second year, wrapping up his uh, thesis project. And it was a very enjoyable first year, in part because of the conversation that, um, personally, that I was privileged to, to, to have with Stelios. Stelios went on to work for B&K and uh, plus Randlhuber, um, I believe a firm that no longer exists, but uh, Arno Randlhuber um, has a new firm in Berlin. And Stelios left the uh, Stelschule, went on to work for them, and um, made a very successful uh, entry into the firm, winning a series of competitions and became a partner. Then he moved on to another firm in Amsterdam called uh, VMX Architects. And that lasted from, uh, so the first round was basically from 2001 till 2004, and then 2000, from 2005 and on, working for the Dutch firm. Um, by and by, oh yes, and then Stelios uh, founded his own um, A3 lab architecture um, a firm and a, um, experimental practice. Um, again, personally, I had the privilege of doing a competition with Stelios at one point. Um, that was great. He was also part of it on the team. And Stelios then did a series of, of competitions and eventually also um, joined with um, Just Burgev Architekten, um, where Malte Just is also a um, Stelschule uh, alumnus. He was in your class. Yes. And Malta has established a successful uh, firm here in Frankfurt. And you went in there and you collaborated on the Marriott uh, Tower um, but not only that, also both uh, canopy outside the hotel, which is up around the fair. So I would believe that all of you have seen it, but also the um, uh, refurbishment of the facade on the outside. And there was a number of um, interesting projects, and uh, around that time you had already launched and uh, made basically a shift from a professional uh, career to uh, an academic one. And that took you uh, globetrotting, you went to uh, the Lebanese American University. You went um, before that, I believe, to Raffles Design Institute in Shanghai. You were five years at, uh, in Darmstadt, at the university there, as a um, scientific or research associate. You've done workshops here. And since 2012, Stelios um, is in Liverpool, where he holds a lect lect lectureship for uh, digital architecture. He teaches both BA and MA modules, and is a technology coordinator um, in the bachelor program third year. And you will be setting up a master program uh, in the year to come. Um, yes. And um, lastly, also to, to fill out uh, basically um, Stelio's path um, till here tonight, 
It's, well, it's only also fair to mention his many publications. It started already in 2008 when you, together with uh, two other um, Stellschule alumni, Marcus Hurut and Gabi Schillig, you edited a book which is called Form Defining Strategies, Experimental Architectural Design. And the list is uh, impressive. There is a whole uh, series of books. One is in print, which is called Biomorphic Design, which will be out on Lawrence King Publishing. Um, 2016, this year, you've had out Generative Design, Form Finding Techniques in Architecture, also with Lawrence uh, King. And you have just to mention one more, because the list is long, um, computational architecture, digital design tools, and manufacturing techniques, and that was 2012. Um, these series of books, edited or fully authored by um, Stelios, is only one part of his um, production of written work. He's um, produced a series of research papers and papers that have been delivered at conferences, published uh, in various magazines, and Shilis, we're very excited to have you back and we very much look forward to your lecture tonight. Thank you everyone. That's really, indeed, uh, I'm very thankful to be here. It's quite a special moment. It's, I've counted, it's 15 years I've graduated. It makes me feel very old. So my, my lecture is going to be called Form Aesthetics and Performance. But before we go into that, I just wanted to show you some images of the time I was a student here. So that's me up there. This is Johan up there, down there. Enrique was still there. Eventually, so he passed away, unfortunately. And then Ben and Johan came in, and the whole school changed. And I think it changed in a great way. Uh, it became bigger, more famous. Uh, much more people came in from much more different countries. And in a way, it was indeed uh, an important pathway for me. Uh, it, it literally changed my life, not only because of the knowledge and experience I, I got in, through the teaching here, but also through the network I have established. And most of the major steps I've taken after that were actually based on uh, relationships which I had built up here. So just to sum up what Johan was just describing, I, I obviously you know, had a bit of a unique Thessaloniki uh, life changing. Uh, pathways as a child, then I moved here to Frankfurt, to Cologne, Amsterdam, Beirut, Shanghai, and then back to Liverpool, uh, where I'm teaching now. So again, the, 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 the topic of, of my lecture is basically describing my own approach or my own struggle with these three ma major notions, which is obviously the form, aesthetics, and performance. And these are indeed different notions. One is form is a descriptive notion. Aesthetics, it's very relative and, you know, it changes with time and in countries. And performance is also something you can count. And it has to, to do with many sorts of performances. It could be material performance, it could be structural performance, environmental performance. And it basically asks for architecture to, to, to achieve something more than just creating space. I think that image summarizes the struggle quite well, which is a kind of a attempt to, you know, create a column which is like a human being. So decorates, kind of impose aesthetics into an architectural part, a structural part, a column. Nevertheless, there are probably more holistic um, approaches uh, on, on that equilibrium between form aesthetics and performance. And I, 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 currently, I'm uh, working uh, at a paper for Shukov, which has just been accepted. These are indeed unpublished documents of the archives in uh, Moscow. And it's uh, these two great projects, Wixa Works uh, Factory and uh, Nizhny Novograd Towers, which uh, in a way summarize all that struggle, all that equilibrium, the fight between aesthetics, performance, and form. And these are his manuscripts. This is, these are his, basically his algorithms, which he, you could see them as common days, grasshopper scripts or Rhino scripts or whatever scripts, but these are actually indeed handmade scripts which define this aesthetic of that tower uh, back in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century. And I find it quite exciting, you know, to see that object, which obviously would have been monstrous comparing to what was uh, around it that time. But somehow, oops, um, nowadays these kind of geometries are pretty common and uh, the, we are used to these aesthetics and in a way I believe that Shukov 
had uh, an, a great impact to the way we design today. This is the, 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 an image of the Pixar works, the, the way it's now. As I said, uh, it will be published in a couple of months in the Journal of uh, IASS. So, quite an interesting um, paper, hopefully. So I'm going to go through the different phases of my life and, and my practice, obviously, and uh, try to explain how I was dealing with these three notions and how I tried to find this equilibrium in my projects. Uh, as Johan mentioned, uh, my collaboration with Arno Brandhuber was actually quite a life-changing experience. I, I joined literally after the Stedl Schule. He was in my jury. I moved to Cologne. I became partner there after a few years. And that was the first competition we won and built collaboration with uh, Dorte Mandrup Architecture in Denmark. So it was a lot, it was a sports and cultural center in Copenhagen, and it was a huge problem for, for the city to have this un uncompleted block of these four, four blocks. So what we did basically in the competition was to combine all these parameters, or all, all, all these components which were important uh, for the uh, uh, city and obviously for us as designers, we took the main volume of the, of the sports hall, applied the regulations, then joined this, this uh, geometry in, in a, the most obvious shape. There were, there were a lot of issues with uh, environmental performance, natural lighting, there was a need of um, constant diffused light. So we chose uh, obviously to optimize the shape in order to meet the price. Uh, you know, uh, reasons and uh, limitations. And obviously we, we integrated um, um, polycarbonate panels in its environmental skin in order to, to create that constant uh, blurry light. And uh, that's what it, it is actually, quite a simple structure. The interior was also seen as an extension of, uh, of the ground, which basically transformed into the tribunes. And uh, structurally, we went for a combination of steel and timber in order to match our budget. And quite interesting relationships of you know, transparency and translucency, uh, which then uh, moved to the next project in Holland. Um, that was working with VMX architects. What I learned in Holland was that um, you know, they have a very particular way of building because they build in a very limited budget, probably less limited than we're used to, to build in Germany or in the UK or in other countries. That was a school, a Montessori school. It is a, quite a specific uh, way of teaching, of education for, for, for kids. So the program was essential to, to, to act as a form-finding mechanism. So you, there were different requirements in heights. The plot of land was pretty defined. The, the, the volume of the building was also uh, cl clearly defined by the urban planners. So basically, by joining all these, all these parameters, the criteria, the building emerged uh, out of that. And obviously, we had to find the, the, the most efficient way to construct it by building it in a very low budget. Uh, what I find quite uh, interesting is that the school courtyard uh, didn't have a f doesn't have a fence still, so that means there is just this blue print on the, on the ground and there is no fence around it. So kids actually start to accept that uh, space, which is not defined spatially but just on, on the floor, as, as an actual boundary. And, and uh, apparently that was one of the first uh, schools which embedded such an approach. Moving on from there, uh, I came back to Frankfurt, as uh, Johan just said, and met Malte again, which of course we were studying together. And we collaborated on the Mario Tower, uh, which was totally updated back then. It was, I think we completed the project in uh, 2010. Malte and Till, uh, very good friends. Uh, we had a great collaboration and a great time. Um, so. One of the problems facing was the whole ent entrance zone, which was a bit of a conglomerate of different interventions. The building had environmental problems, so it was outdated, obviously, and it had an image problem. It was empty. There, there were not enough uh, um, tenants in there. Actually, the upper part is Marriott. The lower part is Marriott. The middle zone is actually uh, rental offices. So most of them used to be empty. So. 
in, by upgrading the building, the whole idea was to attract uh, new clients who would rent out space there. So we were working again, you know, with, with a civil engineer, uh, Victor Wilhelm, uh, and it was always this struggle of which geometry, how would it perform, uh, finance obviously, can we build it, how big is it going to be, how will it look, will it, will it be part of the building, will it be kind of a different, uh, almost like a parasite or something which belongs to the nature. So we kind of thought to, we decided after all this process of testing to go for a geometry which would somehow communicate with this plate tree rows, which are pretty typical here in Frankfurt. So that's the diagram which describes what we did. We basically uh, took the available space, elevated uh, the, the plan uh, to, to the height which was required in order to accommodate uh, cars and buses in terms. There were two entrances, as you can see, so we kind of lifted the, lower, the, the, the smaller thinner part up in order to highlight the back side entrance. And then we applied the Voronoi structure, which was supposed to resemble trees and their intelligence, and then generated the, the, the three columns out of them, which had to land on the piles of the um, car park underneath. So obviously we, we didn't just use the geometry as, as a formal approach, but we, uh, we applied uh, finite element analysis processes in order to simulate the geometry and, and inform it with performative aspects, so it would reduce the steel consumption and uh, save us money. It was at the time where the oil prices were very high, the steel prices were very high back then, before the financial crisis eventually started. So steel was very expensive these days. And we actually managed to do that. So the, the whole geometry, as you can see, the pluses are kind of indicating a certain, a certain degree of curvature which uh, came in in order to uh, accommodate the flow of forces. And then obviously we had to look into fabrication. So we decided to uh, assemble it, not on the, on the knots, not on the joints of all these uh, branches, but actually in the middle of the branch, in order to avoid the welding problem. Uh, so you can see all these components are actually meeting here, in the middle of each branch. And then obviously we decided to go for uh, ETFE cushions in order to accommodate the double curvature and obviously to save weight. That was quite an exciting process because of the complexity of the, pro of the project. Everything had to be designed three-dimensionally. There was not really much use of 2D drawings other than handing them in into the planning permit. Uh, and this was, you know, the biggest the most complex point, like when all the pipes would come together in a joint. So that's the reason we decided to basically start joining the components within the branch and not on the edge, not on the vertices. Uh, plasma cutting was the technology applied in order to cut all the different pipes. There were hundreds of them, if not thousands. And then obviously the whole project had to be assembled on, on, in the factory re in reverse and then basically, um, once it was done, complete, they were sprayed, galvanized, left out to dry, brought over to Frankfurt, and they were assembled. So you can see what I was saying before, like these are the knots here. So the, the workers would go with a, with a gigantic screwdriver in and, and screw the pieces together and then cover them up with um, some kind of cover. Drainage, that was the phase of construction, which was also quite, quite thick. You can see the size, it's about 1,200 square meters. And then that was the finished project. Uh, that's during the night. And again, I think that this relationship was actually achieved, looking back to it, even now. The other issue was the, the facade, the, the environmental retrofit. So we had to come up with a system which would upgrade the tower energetically and reduce its carbon dioxide uh, footprint and obviously upgrade its aesthetics as well. Uh, so we came up 
with the idea of the Moray effect, basically an effect which occurs when two grids overlap and then according to the way you look at it, the, the wave, this kind of wavy pattern changes according to the light and the angle of observation. Uh, we, we, we quickly went into a kind of folding system of panels which would r reproduce this effect and obviously tried many iterations. Um, in, in terms of uh, energy upgrades, we added obviously insulation, we added a, a cooling uh, ceiling, suspended ceiling, shading devices, screens and, and new heating, which made the building actually uh, reduce its U-value uh, almost to half and, and achieve you know, a, a green building standard, which was also awarded as one the year after its completion. Uh, lots of studies, lots of models. The, the, the color was a big debate. The city was quite scared of us, like, who are you guys unknown to, to do such a big project here? So they asked uh, for, for, for patterns, for, for kind of testing the colors and see how it will fit into the skyline. Um, at the end of the day, as you can see, the color we chose is almost the same as the glass used. So when the, the, the light is in particular, when the sun is in particular positions, as you might have seen yourself, the pattern becomes more intense or less intense according to how you experience it. There was also photovoltaic panels being on the edges, which were obviously towards the south. And then that's the, that's the facade, that's the entire image of it. And obviously that. And again, what, what I still find quite exciting is, is that the way the, the building changes, even though it's, it's, it's a static facade, it's not a moving facade. But uh, it, 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 it looks like a different building according to the di daytime and, and season. Uh, yeah, probably you've seen all that yourself sometimes if you walk around there. Now, what is significant about that project is that uh, when I moved uh, to the UK, I applied for a research grant uh, on a similar topic with a colleague of mine called Rosa Urbano. And we actually received a research trust award by the RBA to investigate the aesthetics of sustainable retrofits of uh, residential houses, towers in Britain. Now, you know, I'm mo mo mostly the person who wants to rush in and starts designing. But sometimes it's actually quite wise not to do so and just look thoroughly and analyze things and gather data in order to apply them after a while. So we're very happy that this project is finishing now. It was a very big honor for us receiving such an award from the RBA and a huge responsibility, obviously. We should complete it by the end of the year, hopefully, and it should come out in a book from Routledge uh, next year. So I'm going to show you briefly a bit of that project. I mean, uh, for those who have been to the UK, probably know that London and many of the UK cities have these monstrous towers everywhere, which are a result of the Second World War. So after the destruction happening, the, the city council started to, to build uh, cheap residential blocks, but also sold them as a new image of the modernity in, in society, and you know bringing people from the Victorian uh, or you know terrace housing to a modern way of life. And there are some quite iconic buildings actually which I love, like the Trellick Tower or the Golden Lane Estate, which are in the middle of London and. You know, it's a weird relationship because people love them and hate them. Uh, and they're kind of decaying, but on the other hand, they have very good floor plans. They're very cheap, very affordable, a great view. And there is a debate which I think goes on all over Europe and maybe even beyond Europe because many countries have these issues of, you know, what do you do with these tower blocks now? Um, so they want to demolish them. And I think they, some deserve to be observed, actually. Uh, observed, yeah. And they're actually part of the heritage of this country, as much as the Victorian and the Georgian. Uh, so then we started basically, yeah, they have some amazing features, like this kind of almost Corbusier-like roof gardens. Um, so basically what we wanted to do, what we proposed, was to find out what's happening, to see where are these towers, where are these com compounds, because we're not talking about towers only, it's the entire estates update the process, come up with a data sheet and get conclusions of, of the whole process you know, and, and evaluate it in order to move on and start proposing interventions, which is actually the second phase of the project. So we narrowed down the, the, the research field into London, obviously, because it's you know, a massive city. And then the other biggest cluster of urban um, 
let's say, an urban uh, metropolis is Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds and Sheffield, which is called the Northern Powerhouse these days. So I'm going to show you briefly what we have done. Obviously, you know, it's not finished yet, but uh, just to, to get a glimpse of what I've been doing the last three years and on that the demand. So we basically located about 40 estates in London, visited them, visited them all, documented them, and tried to see what intervention has happened there. And obviously looking at the aesthetics of the tower, um, and then you can see you, you can see yourself, you know, what, what has happened. I'm going to show some very weird um, projects, some good, some bad. Sometimes, you know, they've been only color intervention. Sometimes they have applied all these horrible aluminum panels with insulation. Um, obviously, a very important issue was how do you deal with the so-called social sustainability? Because people uh, tend to privatize those uh, buildings and then sell them very expensive money. In some cases, they have used renewable energy. As you can see, you know, the aesthetic. Did it really improve? That was actually the real question. Is it, is it better now than it used to be before? Um, is there any control over such a process? This is a very good case. That's a killing house. That's a listed building. And actually, they haven't done anything which is environmental friendly on that. It's just they just painted it. So in a way, it, it missed its target, which is also interesting to see what happens if a building got, gets listed as this is. Uh, and so on. That's the uh, fair point. So we, we, we started, you know, categorizing them and creating all these charts and try to derive data on what has happened when. The color schemes, we found out that, you know, colors were very important after all. So because most of the architects basically just changed the color. Uh, obviously, what extent of retrofit was applied? How have they used? all these programs and the progress. And the same we did also for the Northern Powerhouse, so-called Leeds. The North ten tends to be more colorful and more tacky. Um, that's the Town of Towers in Manchester, which I think is one of the best examples. And so on. Uh, Park Hill, quite a monstrous uh, settlement. And then the, they have basically added all these colored pa color panels. Um, and again, you know, the same type of categorization, evaluation, and obviously lots of conclusions coming out, which I, I don't want to tire you now with them, but uh, if I could sum it up, uh, to me it's, it's, it's making us think whether we as, as a, you know, modern age architects uh, are doing the right thing. Um, so these different aesthetics which have been applied have they really led to variation and improvement, or, or is it another homogenization which has taken place? Uh, and obviously, you can see a lot of interesting things in terms of how much the uh, privatization has improved. So, that brings me back to Beirut, which was before I went to London, to Liverpool, obviously. Uh, Beirut has something which not many people know. Uh, in Tripoli, of, Be of Lebanon, there is a huge export done by Oscar Niemeyer, uh, which is a small Brasilia. And actually, it was left uncompleted just before the Lebanese civil war started. Uh, so the, the whole uh, state is, is in a kind of semi-completed ruin status, which makes it very poetic. When Mark and Beatrice came to visit in Beirut, we went and, and saw that project, and, and they were enthusiastic. And in a way, I think it again, you know, it, it is this debate about aesthetics, performance, and form. And in that particular case, this local characteristics which uh, Oscar brought in his architecture, this kind of arabesque design, which I think influenced me when I did my little modest chapel in, in Greece. So that's a kind of a funny reference. But I was doing that project during that time. It was a small uh, private chapel um, in an island of Kea. And funnily enough, the clients was one was uh, Iraqi and she was Greek, obviously. So they wanted this kind of merge of, of cultures and I wanted to do something up to date it. So this kind of m weird mix came up with uh, Cycladic 
ornamental elements, uh, obviously oriental elements and, and kind of uh, computational appeal. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened to that project because I, I, I never visited them after that and the crisis started and we kind of had an argument. So I'm afraid they built it, the, the, the church because I have no clue how it looks like. But anyway, I, I, I'm still, I still consider, consider that to be one of my favorite uh, projects. Uh, that's the interior. Now, while I went to Shanghai, um, the challenge there was, I, I worked for Raffles Design Institute, obviously, and uh, we were asked to, to design an exhibition for that gallery, um, uh, Tonki Gallery. Uh, it was about 1,000 square meters, so it's a very big space. And the challenge was to build something with a very low budget, like extremely low. We had 13,000 yuan, which is about uh, 1,200 euros. So, you know, th that's quite a zero cost architecture, basically. But that's, that's a challenge which we took. And, you know, I, I did it with a friend, a colleague, uh, Brian Manning Spind. Uh, so we, we tried to, to find, obviously, the idea was to create this kind of field of distorted field of um, pixels which would accommodate exhibits and would also spatially define the space and define routes and pathways within that, uh, that gallery. And you can see we kind of came up with this kind of block and uh, kind of textile architectural element uh, which I will show you in a minute. So it should be this kind of space and all with um, 1,000 euros. 1,200. So we, we, we chose that, that hook, hooks, you know, you use for your toilet and then this screens which you use for shading and obviously MDF panels to construct the boxes. Um, and of course in China things are very cheap indeed, but still that was a bit of a dumping price. But at the end it worked. So in, in, in a way this is another type of performance in my eyes, you know, performance of ultra low budget. And I think the result was actually quite all right considering that it didn't cost anything basically less than a euro per square meter. So that's how it looked like. It stayed there for about two months. Came on TV, it was not bad. Which brings me back to, to Liverpool and London again, uh, and another project we did there uh, with my MA students. So it was again the idea of integrating uh, environmental software and parametric tools particularly solar radiation, and how can you control solar radiation uh, how, with a transparent element? Can you shade with a transparent element? And then there was obviously this idea of the blurriness and um, the, the diffusion and the deception. So we chose that uh, glass tube. We simulated the whole uh, project, obviously, uh, in order to, to control and evaluate what we have achieved. Um, and actually you can shade with transparent elements, surprisingly enough, and quite well. Um, the diffusion effect was also quite interesting because it literally blurs and, and functions almost like a waterfall. And um, yeah, that was set up in the school. We wrote a paper uh, about it, it's published, uh, it's published in the KD uh, conference proceedings in Newcastle, I think it was. And here are some of the happy students work there, then we moved on applying lighting and LED and see how they would, uh, how the pipes would react during the night. So we found that the, the, the exciting things you can do actually by applying lights during the night. So it could work uh, night and day. Uh, and hopefully the idea was, to, you know, in a way all these projects are linked because we, we, we saw it more as a facade system which we could probably apply in order to shade buildings. Uh, so this is still a project which we will continue. Uh, another uh, project, also a research project, was the ceramic uh, screens. Uh, we worked with a ceramic uh, fabrication lab of Liverpool Hope University. And we wanted to see how we can merge digital fabrication with uh, ceramic crafting. There are all these techniques. Uh, and we, we realize that they're, they're not really using digital, soft, digital tools that much. They're very traditional. So we wanted to, to combine simulation, environmental simulation. Uh, we wanted to combine specific fabrication techniques with specific uh, ceramic fabrication techniques. 
and test them and create uh, innovative products out of clay which weren't existing. So we, we came up with that kind of fabrication process um, which is basically allowing certain uh, loops to emerge and when we, we, we test and simulate and then uh, redo the, the, the test and, and, and basically fire the object at the end. It was of course spec specified for the three techniques. So one of them was working with clay slabs and CNC milling with formers. As you can see now, I think it makes things easier. So the whole uh, hypothetical uh, element was a shading, a light diffusing screen, which was supposed to blur light in, in galleries on a ceiling, like a ceiling like that, which would create a constant light underneath. So we would simulate these components and optimize them in order to achieve the value we wanted. And then obviously test the fabrication techniques. In that case, the formers were made obviously out of CNC and then the slabs were applied and assembled on them. Once the objects dried, we would fire them and see how the whole process went. Did the crack, did, did it work? Quite exciting actually because the, we realized that there were amazing uh, opportunities uh, lying there for innovation. Also working with different types of clay like porcelain, uh, infiltrated with, with uh, paper so it becomes lighter and so on. Um, now this one worked with uh, CNC milling and extrusion. It's a very funny process. So th th these were f four helixes which basically would diffuse the light underneath. Uh, that's the extruder. So you would get the sausage coming out of the, of the extruder and then apply them on a former, let them dry and create the helices. Then obviously you need to adjust them and assemble them in a, in a kind of perpendicular order. And the last um, test we made was uh, based on uh, slip casting and uh, 3D printing. Slip casting is, is an interesting process because you basically cast the, the clay in a liquid stage. You create a mold, you print the object, which was this one you can see on the left, and then you create a negative object of it, create a, a, a former mold, fill it up with, with clay, and then it, it basically uh, wraps around the walls of the, of the mold and then once it dries out you, you have a, almost a, a perfect reproduction of it. Proved to be quite a successful uh, method. Uh, and yeah, that, that was the, um, the final output. There will be a paper coming out as well very soon, Journal of Architecture Engineering. And coming to the end, uh, is the last project I'm going to show you, it was the Eris Edge Chelsea Flower Show. Well, I was asked to do that almost a year ago. Uh, this is the Chelsea Flower Show. I didn't know about it, but apparently the British people love it and it's super popular. There are thousands of people going there. It's a, something like a Bundesgarten show, but uh, in an imperial setting. So, uh, this project was actually funny because I was approached by the um, astrophysics department of Liverpool John Moores. And they wanted to, it was funded by the National School Observatory, which is basically an education project for kids to understand science in a better way. So they wanted to create a garden, which would be the dark matter garden, which would explain them the theory of dark matter. Now, what is the theory of dark matter? Uh, it's a theory which says that there is something in all this void in the universe, which actually we can't see and we don't know what it is. That's why we call it dark but it deforms the rays of life as they cross through the universe. So they wanted to create that, uh, let's say, instance of a deformed ray of life by the dark matter. So then we applied, you know, we worked in, with Grasshopper and applied uh, gravitation points and started to work with them in order to achieve a certain result. Obviously we had, you know, a very clear footprint. So it was 10 by 3 meters and 3 high. And then we started working with them and placing the points, improving the system until we finally uh, reached the, the result they thought would ex explain the dark matter the way they wanted and would be realistic enough for people to understand. That's how it looked like. Unfortunately, there came all these plants later. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's how, uh, how the footprint was. So we're talking about uh, 10 by 3. There was obviously a vertical grid which would keep these steel pipes, uh, I'm revealing you what it's made of, 
and then obviously we had to CNC bend all these pipes. We had to cut them into pieces. Quite a challenging process because we, we had to transform that X, Y, Z coordinates to LR, uh, LRA, which means angle, length, and radius. So it would be an approximate geometry to the original one, but almost identical. And then went over to Manchester and started producing the pipes. And then there it was. It was built. Unfortunately, they planted all these things around it. But that's how it is. That was a garden. It served its purpose quite well, actually, uh, which was obviously to educate people and see the rays of life being deformed. And then we saw the Queen coming over, handing us the gold medal, <laughs> which was actually quite a uh, funny and uh, nice incident. So that's the end, I think. If you have any questions, please ask me. Yeah, please. Sir. Depends really where you go, you know, where you start your career. I mean, where, where I started, I felt it wasn't that difficult at all. Because there was a common uh, level of uh, intellectuality, let's say, in the office when I started working with Arno, which, even though formally, let's say, it was obviously not as expressive as you're used to uh, produce uh, as, in, in, a, in a student state of mind, um, I didn't find it that difficult, actually. As long as you could still be convinced of following in a process and being faithful to your beliefs and to your principles. So I never went for a commercial office, let's say. Uh, but I guess if you start to work for a very commercial, a very corporate office, it might be quite hard. Yeah. That wasn't easy. That wasn't easy, no. That was quite difficult. Wow, well, lots, lots of uh, sweating. But we were a great team, obviously, you know, and, uh, but there was a lot of mistrust from uh, many people. At the end, we got support. Uh, there were also people who supported us. So the, 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 what, what a kind of background story is that the city was very skeptical about our design, and then they asked us to bring uh, established architects to, to support us. So we made a workshop with uh, Til Schneider, um, um, uh, who else came? I think uh, Engel came and um, from Kaispe and uh, from the, the um, Katsola Schmal from uh, the dam. So there were people who supported us, but obviously there was a lot of skepticism. And uh, at the end, you just have to, 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 to keep going, you know. And, and there were times where you think it, it's not going to work, but then it does. Yeah. Anything else? Are you separated from the status Oh, good question. Depends on the project. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, there are some projects which uh, aesthetic dominates and others where performance dominates. I think that the, the most successful projects are those where this merge smoothly together and you cannot separate one from the other. So they kind of work harmonically. Yeah, I mean uh, the actual performance in terms of the target we set in the beginning. So le le let's say the target for the Marriott was to achieve a green building status, insulate the building and achieve an aesthetic which would 
um, you know, be appreciated. I mean, how do you how do you evaluate that? There's no evaluation. I mean, there are all these prices you see, but then are they really? Obviously, a price is a good thing, but it's not proving anything, right? At the end, it's also your personal choice. You know, do you like the project? Like re revising it after years, looking at it. Uh, I think that that's what counts to me. Where where I'm pleased with it. Because it's such a relative uh, term, isn't it? And we're, we're scared to, to talk about aesthetic, like, oh, we shouldn't talk about aesthetics. So we all try to sell it as something else. But it matters a lot, after all, you know, and then simple people, that's all they care. I think that the, the London project uh, shows a lot of how, how wrong things can go if somebody starts to pick colors as an aesthetical choice and, and just decorate the towers in order to make them look nice, you know, and then they look horrible. So, in a way, that's the lesson to learn. And nobody has applied any innovative technology, any, any innovative approach. They're all just banal. So, yeah. I have another question. Yeah. Is there a shooter, 2001, then Germany and Liquid, then you went to Holland, and then back here, and then the UK, and in between all the other places. <laughs> it changed every time, yeah, and, and you know the, the, the understanding of every, every country had its, had its own aesthetic and its own uh, acceptance on, in terms of or standards of performance, let's say. Um, so, obviously, being in the UK, it's a different story because I'm mostly ac academically active. So, that's a more convenient position to be. But there, the, the terms of performance are coming in a kind of research-based uh, activity. So looking into how can you adapt um, parameters which will matter for others to, to maybe apply them, which is then environmental strategies, for example. Uh, so that's very measurable. But obviously, we're always looking into innovation and, and um, obviously uh, creating outputs which are pleasing for us, at least, you know. Yeah, that was hard, actually, yeah. To, 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 because you, you see all that and you, you want to, to, to design, but uh, sometimes it's good not to design. Let others do the job. Uh, and maybe you try to inform the, the process, and maybe then you design uh, a part of, of a universal solution, which is actually what I'm doing now. But it's good to know what has happened, you know, before you uh, can start such a process to have an established uh, and clear uh, argument. Obviously, yeah, obviously, but uh, I think there is always a so-called research by design, which I, I think that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in, in design outputs. You don't have the pressure of, of, the, um, of the client, but you have the, the pressure of the founder. So in a way, there are similarities. Yes, please. Yeah. 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 A lot, yeah. Exactly. I mean, that, that's what happened there. I mean, uh, th all those projects were initially social housing projects. Uh, in the 80s, Margaret Thatcher started to privatize uh, lots of those uh, states. Now, there is a kind of um, 40 to 60 percent. But the, ten the trend is to goes towards privatization because they can't afford uh, upgrading them. So once they upgrade them, they sell them. And then obviously in London, the, 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 the rents uh, 
go ten times higher, and then people are forced to move out and, and you know just end up moving in the end of the world. So it is an issue, obviously. In the north, it's a bit better uh, because uh, there isn't such a high demand on, on um, housing as in London, or at least you know London has a lot of investment. Uh, in, into housing, uh, which is spe speculative. So it's, it's one of the, uh, of the outputs because we obviously see through our research that um, in many cases people had to leave and then the social sustainability gets ruined basically. So you have rich people coming in or Arab uh, investors or Chinese investors buying flats and resell them after a few years. So, so we also see the social housing as uh, okay, uh, not a very good model, let's say it as a uh, positive certain activation and you see it in terms like the okay, so I didn't hear you now, sorry. You see, uh, there's a certain aspect of alienation with respect to the yeah. model of social housing. You know, yeah. You also look into that by when you're in your research when you know not not really because you have to, to know where to limit <laughs> yourself also. Yeah. Yeah, but obviously, yeah, you're right. It, it is it is an important issue. It just we, we realized it was a vast project, bigger than we could handle, and we're already three years dealing with it. Uh, so we kind of uh, had to stop and just write it up because we have our deadlines passing. <laughs> so, sometimes things things are as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It's so warm in here. Thank you so much. Yeah.